Welcome to our November edition of Fridley's Community Connection. In this episode, we will take a look at new development coming to Fridley. But first, the Fridley Alumni Choir celebrates 20 years of serving the community through song. Thank you for joining us. I'm Raquel Strand and this is Community Connection. As we kick off November, there's no better way to get into the holiday spirit than through music. Just ask the Fridley Alumni Choir. These former Fridley High School students gather each year to pay it forward with free concerts for their community and to raise money through voluntary donations that goes towards scholarships for current Fridley High School students. This season marks the choir's 20th anniversary and their world premiere of a specially commissioned work called Out of the Ashes. Choir director Randy Edinger tells us more. No, no, no. My name is Randy Ettinger and I'm the director of the Fridley High School Alumni Choir. The Fridley High School Alumni Choir is a group of Fridley High School alumni that have sung in the choir when they were in high school and we get together every fall, we rehearse about 10 to 12 times, put on two public concerts. Um, the concerts are free, although we do have a scholarship fund that we uh, are associated with. It's called the Sterling Scholarship Fund and in the past 20 years We've given 43 scholarships, totaling about $57,000. So it's quite, a, um, a, 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 quite a, a great endeavor for this choir to raise that kind of money. And of course, we have a lot of fun singing. We all sang in high school, uh, most of us under the direction of Dave Ryan, who started this alumni choir 20 years ago. And since this is our 20th anniversary, we've done something special this year. We've commissioned a world-renowned composer by the name of Ola Yelo. He's a Norwegian who now lives in the United States, and he composed a piece of music just for this choir, just for this occasion of our 20th anniversary. The choir is open to anybody from, who is a Fridley High School alum who sang in the choir when they're in high school, and you can check our Facebook page to see when we start rehearsing in the fall. And this year, our concerts are November 22nd at four o'clock at the Fridley United Methodist Church and December 6th, uh, which is also a Sunday, at four o'clock here in the Fridley District uh, Auditorium att attached to the high school. <laughs> Last month, we said goodbye to director Don Abbott as he moves on to new adventures in his retirement. This month, we congratulate Brian Weirke as he takes over the role of Director of Public Safety. Brian is no stranger to Fridley, having served with the police department since 1995 in various roles, including police captain. He shares with us the strength and challenges that face the department in the coming year. Fridley is very fortunate to have dedicated, hardworking police officers, leadership, and support staff all who have helped me make my transition to Director of Public Safety seamless. We have a great community. One of our department's biggest strengths is the partnership we have with our residents and businesses, especially with our neighborhood block captains, our neighborhood resource officer program, and our partnership with the schools. We also have some very skilled leaders within our Fridley police staff that set us aside from other cities. We have our dedicated pawn detective, we participate in the Regional Drug Task Force, our canine units, including our newest canine, Jacks. Sergeant Steve Monsrud is currently attending the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and Lieutenant Mike Monsrud will soon be promoted to captain. But even with the great police staff we have, there are some challenges on the horizon. The climate of policing is very difficult and dangerous right now. Attitude towards police are changing and our top priority is the relationship we have with all of you. We've had a number of retirements, 
which means we have many new officers. Because of this, we are focusing a lot of attention on our training and showing them our continued commitment to the community. We ask our community to continue to be great partners with your police department. No one knows your neighborhood better than you. If you see anything out of sorts or suspicious, please don't hesitate to call 911. That's what we're here for. Thank you and I look forward to serving you. We also honor Captain Bob Rewitzer for serving 26 years with the Fridley Police. Bob is known for his commitment to the city and strong work ethic and will be sincerely missed as he embarks on a very deserving retirement. Congratulations to Lieutenant Mike Monsrud as he fills Bob's shoes as our next police captain. This is an exciting time to be a Fridley resident. Springbrook broke ground on their new nature center last month and the demolition of Columbia Arena offers new opportunities for the future. Vibrancy continues to grow in other parts of the city too. Here's Community Development Director Scott Hickok with a closer look on what's coming to Fridley Market and the progress of the BAE Northern Stacks area. 2015 was an excellent year for development in the city of Fridley. I think just about anywhere you look you can see that there are permits on buildings and there's activity abound. We're visiting the site right now of Fridley Markets. You might remember that we went through the development process for this planned unit development back in 2010. So it's been some time coming, but we've seen some exciting additions. Today we're going to talk about a couple of those additions. One is a what the developer called Retail B, which is a multi-tenant building that is approximately 10,000 square feet. We'll also talk about a hotel that is on the southwest corner of the site. This is a 124 unit building. We'll start with Retail B. You might remember back in the early stages of this planned unit development, there were two buildings to be along 57th Avenue. Part of the excitement about this planned unit development is that buildings would sit closer to 57th and give kind of a Main Street feel to the uh, corridor along 57th. Retail A became McDonald's, as you know, and has been a very nice addition to this development here. Retail B is going to be a mix of tenants. It will be just shy of 10,000 square feet. Three tenants have been named for this complex. The westernmost tenant will be Caribou Coffee, and we'll have a drive-through, as customers might expect. A middle tenant will be Great Clips. There will be a couple other small retail tenant spaces available there. And then the end cap on the east side will be Panchero Mexican Restaurant, which is a new addition to this market of restaurants, and we're very excited about that. Wood Springs Suites, formerly known as Value Place Hotels, is going to locate a 124-unit hotel on this site. Again, thinking back to the planned unit development that was approved, you might remember that there was a retail space that was allocated for the southwest corner of the site. That retail space could have taken shape in form of a couple retailers or the developer had always talked about their hopes for having a hotel on that site. As hotel developers looked at the site, there was excitement about the number of cars that travel by on 694 every day. It made that site a very exciting candidate for Wood Spring Suites. And actually, of the three hotels they're building new to Minnesota, and these will be the first Wood Spring Suites in Minnesota, Fridley has one, and this site is one that they're most excited about. It has great visibility. It's within this redeveloped shopping complex that will add synergy, excitement, and opportunity for their residents who may want to shop at Cub who may want to shop at Fridley Liquors or Duluth Trading or any one of the new retailers that we've just been talking about. Expect to see the hotel breaking ground in spring of 2016. They were really hoping to be in the ground by fall of 2015, but details on the development uh, have kept them a bit behind their uh, desired schedule. One of those details included the fact that corporate Wood Spring Suites was very, very interested in this site for one of their corporate stores, and they were able to negotiate with an earlier petitioner that was going to be a franchisee. So what does this mean to Fridley? This will be a corporate store, one that they will take great pride in, 
and one that will be one of the first for Wood, Wood Spring Suites. We're now standing on the grounds of the Northern Stacks Industrial Development. You know if you've been watching that this is one of the most exciting industrial developments, not only in Fridley, but in the Twin Cities right now. It is 122 acres of cleanup of a Superfund site and 1.7 million square feet of future industrial users will be on this site. Over my shoulder you see two stacks from the earlier development. Those stacks aren't coming down in the demolition. Those will stay and really have been the namesake for this development. On one of the stacks you see five stars and a large E. That is the prestigious battle award that is given to this site. Typically, this is given to warships during war times for incredible feats of that ship and the crew that's on it. Because of the wartime victories that happened right on this site, this site was given this prestigious set of awards over the life of the development here. Inside the walls of that industrial complex, there were mounts made for gunships and so forth. Pieces that were so important to those gunships that they were awarded these awards. That history can't be lost. Paul Hyde knew that. And he not only plans to keep the stacks and those prestigious awards evident, but in the building below, he hopes to do something to honor the history of this site hopefully creating a small artifact museum, possibly, that would harken back to some of the earlier times on this site and to give people a good sense about what this site was back from the time in the 40s when the building was built. Look forward, uh, keep watch as this development unwinds and this small tribute to our history on this site unfolds. As we get excited about the growth and improvements that are happening around the city, we also face challenges in our city services buildings that must be addressed. City Manager Wally Weisipol takes us on a visual tour of the current conditions of Fridley City Hall and the Public Works Garage. Hi, I'm City Manager Wally Weisopel, and I want to provide you a closer look into the conditions of our City Hall and Public Works buildings. Now you may not be aware of these conditions because you don't have a chance to come and visit our city hall or public works very often and from the outside they may not look all that bad. That's why I want to provide you a little closer look into the conditions so you can understand what our needs are. Now back in 2014 the city council authorized a study to take place by an independent engineering firm and architectural firm to look at the conditions of our buildings. Now what the study told us is that we have deficiencies in three areas. One is that the handicapped accessibility to the, the building is problematic. Two is that we have significant deterioration of the building requiring immediate repairs. And then three, we're lacking space uh, for our operations of about 20,000 square feet of additional space is necessary. Beginning with the handicapped accessibility, if you were to park here, and move into the city hall, it would be about 200, 200 feet to the front door. Once you're in our city hall, you'll notice that our, our countertops are not at the appropriate level for a handicapped person in a wheelchair. Our elevator also does not pass handicapped current codes. As you can see, in, once inside, if you're in a wheelchair, it's impossible to turn your wheelchair around inside this elevator. Now we're in our parking ramp, and as you can see, we have some serious deficiencies with regard to the structure here that need about $500,000 in repairs. Here we can see where water infiltration is coming in and compromising the integrity of our structure. Here's the entrance to our police and recreation area, which is down below the parking ramp. Now we're inside the holding area of the police station. And in this location, we should have separation between, for juveniles and adults. And as you can see, we don't have that. We're standing in a room that doubles as a emergency response room and also our break room for the police officers. We're inside the men's locker room of the police station. 
and we currently don't have enough lockers for the number of officers that we have serving our community. Now we're standing inside of the evidence room for the police station and this room is to contain all the evidence that's necessary for prosecuting cases and sometimes these ca this material has to stay with us for years. To further evidence the need for space in this room is to accommodate 22 police officers for their case writing and materials that they need to do their job. In addition to the lack of space there is infrastructure needs such as electricity in this room, there's only two outlets to power all this equipment that's necessary for the police to do their, their job. Because of our lack of space in the locker rooms, we've had to improvise inside an outdoor garage for additional storage space for the police officers. These garages have been plagued with water infiltration over the years, causing problems with mold and mildew and damaging the materials and, and uh, equipment that we keep inside those garages. One of the problems with the width of these garages, as you can see, it's difficult to get these vehicles in and out. Here in the gun range, we need about $70,000 in repairs in order to make this range suitable for the needs of the police department and their certification for firearms training. Now we're inside the fire station in the bays themselves, and you can see that the lack of space we have which has occurred because uh, over the years these fire trucks and all of our apparatus have gotten larger and larger. Air quality is also a concern within the fire station. Here you can see that when the particulate matter exhausts out of these trucks into the station itself, we don't have adequate ventilation to, to recirculate the air. We're standing inside of the office area and sleeping quarters for the fire captains. This doubles the space. Uh, they utilize it for their daily work and in doing inspections and then also for overnight sleeping. There is not gender separation within this room. Inside the fire department we have some storage areas underneath and these areas are not handicapped accessible as you can see. Here at the Public Works Garage we house our street operations, our water and sewer, and here we also keep all of our vehicles we provide all our mechanic repair, so let's take a closer look and see what kind of conditions we have. First, we're going to take a look at our gas pumps. This is where all of our trucks and our cars come to fuel. And if you notice, there's no canopy overhead that you'll see at most gas stations. One of the problems we have at the Public Works Garage is space. We don't have enough of it. And this will indicate to you when one of our trucks has to come in and get repaired, how tight the quarters are for our mechanics to be able to get around and get to the service everything. So here at the Public Works Garage, they take care of over 300 vehicles and pieces of equipment. This is one of them that you'll often see in the wintertime, one of our plow trucks. And as you can see, if this truck needs to get repaired, it needs to come in here with the plow on, and it would also have a sander on the back. If that sander was on attached to this vehicle right now, you would not be able to walk through that garage door. So also notice up on top how close we are to the, you know, the, the ceiling with the, uh, the boom and also the uh, garage door. Again, this indicates that when this building was built back in the 1950s, it was better suited for the size of the vehicles at that time. Now our big trucks pose a real problem for our mechanics to safely work on these vehicles. Now we're inside one of the storage areas for our vehicles. Inside here, our mechanics will do some work on vehicles. They'll also wash the vehicles uh, because we do have, this is one of the only uh, buildings that has a sewer system in it that we can get the water out. If you look on top, you can see that we don't have very much space. As a matter of fact, you can see in a couple of places the ventilation systems have been hit by the vehicles. Um, again, indicating how these vehicles over the years have gotten bigger all the time so they can do the work more efficiently for us. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough space to keep them inside safely. Of particular interest to us is this VACCON truck. Now this is the truck that will go out to clean the sewers out and we'll also use it at water main breaks to, to suck up the excess water so that the crews can get to that water main break efficiently. Now that truck in itself is going to be about half a million dollars, 
um, and it takes up two spaces. This is a fairly new uh, purchase for us and we never had this type of vehicle before. So it's displaced two other vehicles that would have been inside normally. This vehicle just broke down today. It has a hydraulic leak. And because of all the other vehicles are inside the building, the mechanics are going to have to work on this one outside. Can you imagine working on this, say, in the middle of January or February? Outside in the public works yard, we have a lot of uh, the, the ground is not paved. And this is an example of that. Now, for perspective, Rice Creek is just down over here. And when we get heavy rains or the uh, snowfalls, we get the drainage going in this direction. These uh, bales here are used to be placed in front of the entrance to this building so that the groundwater uh, doesn't uh, go through the building and then uh, get the paver, the uh, asphalt paver wet and then take the oils and from the asphalt and, and take it towards the Rice Creek. So this is something that we have to do on a daily basis to make sure that uh, we're protecting the waterways here. These dump trucks will be sitting outside all night, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, they're about $200,000 a piece, so we got $600,000 right here that you see of, of vehicles that are staying outside all the time. So here you can see the number of garage doors that we have servicing the main building at the Public Works Garage. All these garage doors uh, contribute to the inefficiency, energy inefficiency utilization of this, of this building. So here's again, it illustrates the, the difficulty. We're pulling out a, in and out a $200,000 vehicle. Uh, very tight. So there we've taken you on a closer look for our City Hall and Public Works Garage. So hopefully you can understand the challenges that both buildings face. Challenges regarding the accessibility for handicapped individuals, challenges regarding deterioration and the buildings themselves, challenges regarding the space that we need, inadequacy of space here at these two buildings. Thanks for taking a look at our City Hall and Public Works Garage. Look for more information on these building conditions and steps to address them in the December City Newsletter, which will arrive in homes next month. The City Council will take a closer look at options during upcoming Council meetings, which are open to the public and televised on this channel and online at FridleyMN.gov. This fall has been absolutely beautiful, and we hope you had a chance to enjoy the many events happening around the City. Here's a look back on Springbrook's Pumpkin Night in the Park and the Fire Open House.
just a reminder, winter parking regulations are now in effect through April 1st. There is no parking on Fridley City streets between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. or any time that snow and ice removal is in progress. The Fridley City Council has had a busy fall. Once again, here's City Manager Wally Weisselpohl with the Council update. Hello, I'm City Manager Wally Weisopel and I'm here to provide you an update of our City Council meetings from October 12th and October 26th. Of course, each Council meeting begins with a workshop and on October 12th, the Fire Department provided an update to the City Council on items of interest going on in the Fire Department. One of them is, uh, is called Automatic Aid. And this is an opportunity for the City of Columbia Heights and Fridley to join together to help each other out and have automatic aid to each other's cities 24 hours a day. The details are still being worked out and this will help both cities provide up-to-date staffing levels for fire department purposes. On October 26, the City Council talked about legislative issues that they might be want to talking to, the, uh, to our representatives uh, at the state. And one of the items that we want to discuss with them is the possibility of some special legislation to allow for liquor licensing to take place at banquet f facilities, banquet halls. And this is something that in state statute is not allowed for cities like Fridley. To, we can only have liquor served at restaurants and at hotels. And of course, we do have a couple of uh, banquet facilities in town, and it would be beneficial for those, uh, those establishments to be able to have alcohol served there for those events, other than being brought in by a caterer. The legislative agenda was, uh, was robust. We had an animal control uh, uh, services ordinance that was a uh, contract, I'm sorry, that was passed. This is whenever we find a stray dog or a cat animal in the neighborhoods and uh, it has no identification, we need to take it to a location. And this is going to be done at Hillcrest Animal Hospital over in Maplewood. This is a new provider. Uh, in the past, we've used a facility in New Brighton, but they're no longer available. We also had the uh, first and second readings of ordinances regarding dynamic signs. Dynamic signs are those changeable message signs that are becoming very popular that businesses like to put advertising on. And in the past, those signs can only change their message every 45 seconds. Along with some other updates to the code, the new code will now allow those, those signs to change every 8 seconds and therefore be a lot more versatile and effective for those businesses. This item came to us through our business and retention visits that the HRA does uh, with our businesses in town. We also heard of the special assessment hearings and assignment of those assessments. Now, when people can't take care of their, their property well and have code enforcement uh, action taken against them and the city has to abate that property, or for example, take care of the lawn mowing or the tree trimming or the garbage removal, we then assess that property if they don't pay for that. So we had that assessment done. There were about eight properties the last year that we had to go to that extent with. And then we also had what we call lateral repairs. Laterals are the water and sewer lines that connect from the main line in the street to the homes. And every once in a while, somebody gets a surprise that one of those lines need to be repaired. They don't have the money to fix it and we don't want them to be without that water or sewer service so the city will, um, will allow that, that work to be done on our behalf and then we, um, we assess the property to pay that in their property taxes. And We had about eight of those last year. We then took a look at our capital improvement program that was developed uh, beginning last spring and then concluded in October. And the Capital Improvement Program is a document that identifies all of the various equipment uh, purchases and major street uh, reconstruction projects, sewer projects, et cetera, uh, that would be classified as a capital item. And in that document, we justify the need for that uh, program or that equipment, and then we plan for how we're going to pay for it over the next five, 10 years. That document was, uh, was brought forth to the City Council in October 12th meeting and was approved by the City Council and though the information in that document will then help us develop and approve our final budget for 2016. 
Finally, the City Council uh, took action on a request from CenturyLink to become a franchise cable operator in the city. Now, you're familiar that with Comcast right now is the only cable franchise that the city has, uh, but we can have more. And for the first time, and, uh, first time ever, we have a petition to have a second. Now, the process that uh, the city will go through is to hear from anyone else who wants to become a cable franchise provider, and then we will close that period of time and, and accept whatever applications we receive, and we expect to get one from CenturyLink. And then the city council will have an opportunity to review the ability of CenturyLink to provide cable services to the city. And if the city council finds that acceptable, to approve that and begin the negotiation period. Now, the negotiations uh, can take three months. They might take more time than that. Uh, we'll see. And there'll be a lot more information uh, come available once we hear the proposal from CenturyLink, should the city council approve them as a competent provider. That's been the, the events of our city council for October. Thank you for uh, taking the time to watch. I'm Wally Weisopel. Have a good day. In true Minnesota fashion, we welcome colder weather with new outdoor fun. Fridley Recreation invites you to embrace winter by joining a broom ball or boot hockey league. Registration starts November 3rd and league play starts in early January. Prefer to stay indoors? New sessions for adult fitness and family pickleball also start soon. Register online at fridleymn.gov and follow us on Facebook and Twitter for other city news and events. That's all for this edition of Fridley Community Connection. I'm Raquel Strand. Thank you for watching.